Yesterday, um, we had been, we've been working on this place for a long time, little by little, getting things done, new electrical and stuff like that. But yesterday, a whole bunch of us came together and said, okay, we got to get back to business. Olivia put her foot down and said, we're going to church, so get over here and clean up. So we all got together and we started working on our sanctuary. So now we've got paint, we've got electrical that's not all over the place and a little bit sparky and weird. We've got doors that could actually pass code for emergency exits. It's really nice. It felt good for us to work together and all put our hands to the same goal, all trying to get the same thing accomplished. It was really nice to see what we could accomplish when we all worked together. We only had to make one run to the hardware store, which for a Saturday project has got to be some kind of a record. It was nice to work together without fighting and arguing. Like, don't get me wrong. I mean, we're busted on each other all day long, but it's not actual arguing. It's just all in fun. We got along really well. Can you imagine how the world would be if everybody could just work together like that and get along? That, yeah, maybe we pick on each other. We have a little fun here and there, but we actually are working towards the same goal. We're trying to accomplish the same thing and we're getting along doing it. What if I told you there was a time in human history where everyone did work together, all for a common goal, all working together, communicating like they should? Can you imagine how that would be? Not like today where there's two sides of every issue, where we have to tune into our propaganda channel of choice to find out what we're supposed to be mad about today. Can you imagine how that would be? I thought it would be nice to read about that today. So that's what we're going to do. Genesis 11, 1 to 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Sorry for the bait and switch. I felt a lot like Justin putting that intro together. Like, you think you're going to get this nice thing, and then wham, pulls the carpet out. You approve, Justin? Is that a good, good bait and switch? All right. Great. Let's unpack this. So all the people had one language and they found a place to settle. No problem there. Nothing wrong with that. They figured out how to make bricks instead of using stone. And they learned how to use tar for mortar so that the whole thing would be waterproofed. That's neat. Nothing wrong with technological innovation. Then they said, let's go, let's go build a city. Still good. Nothing wrong with that. With a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. That's where the problem starts. What was interesting as I studied about the Tower of Babel, like the story of the flood, which we know as Noah's Ark's flood, lots of civilizations have a story of that flood. Lots of civilizations have a tower story. The Sumerians, the Mayans, um, there was even a tribe in Arizona that has a story of the time when they built a big tower their ancestors built a big tower and their language got confused. I thought that was really interesting. Archaeologists have studied the towers built by ancient groups like this. They call them ziggurats. And historical records say that these towers, and even the inscriptions on a lot of them that still exist, these towers were built not to house anything, but they were built as a staircase so that God could come out of the clouds and stand on the top and walk down and visit his people. Or the gods could do that. So the mindset is God needs our help so that he can come and see us. We better build a big staircase because God, poor God, he's stuck up there in the clouds and I'm sure he'd love to come see us. We better build him a big staircase, a big ladder so he can get down. 
the premise when they built the towers were that they were building them to their gods. But the implication was that God needed the tower and they could build it. So maybe the leaders were more powerful than God? If, if God needs these people to build a tower, who's actually God? Who's actually more powerful? What a great deceit. Okay, you believe in God? Great. Toil and slave and pay your taxes and do all of this because if you want to see God, we have to do this thing together. We've got to build this way for him to get down or for us to get up. So a lot of the details that I just talked about there aren't specifically in this story, but because there are so many accounts of the same story, we can gather sort of the mentality of the people at the time. We can see what type of things were going on with these ziggurats. So during this construction, we read that God did come down to check things out, but he didn't come down the ladder. He didn't come down the steps because he didn't need to. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. The creator doesn't need the creation to accomplish what he wants. They work together, but they work together for the wrong reasons. They decided that they knew what they needed and they knew what God needed and they'd go up to him with this big tower. If they could do that, they'd be safe and happy and everything would be just right. This isn't the first time that man had decided that they would take things into their own hands to become like God. In fact, the very first sin was that. Adam and Eve ate the apple to get, or not the apple, the fruit. We say apple because I don't know why. It's the, what's in the pictures. Adam and Eve ate the fruit so that they could gain the knowledge of good and evil. Why? To become like God. That was their purpose. How did that work out? How did this work out? Why would mankind think they could become like God? In this story, the people were very clear with the motivation. They want to make a name for themselves. In other words, pride, vanity, hubris. Pride is so dangerous and so tempting because we can do things. God says so right here. Oh man, if they all speak one language and work together, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. God said that. I struggled with this idea because we often say we can't do anything apart from Christ. But right here, God says people can accomplish all kinds of things if they put their mind to it and they work together. Maybe that shouldn't come as a surprise. We are, after all, made in God's image. Maybe it's not that we can't do whatever we want without God, but that he won't let us because he wants to remind us who God actually is. Maybe... That's why pride is so tough, because these people knew how to make bricks. They had done the calculations. It was going to work. They had done the engineering studies. They did the finite element analysis. This thing's going to stand. I, I was reading about the way that they made bricks back then and how they built these ziggurats and the way they stepped them in, and there was no room inside. It was just a big pile of bricks. Estimates are they could have built something anywhere from just shy of the Empire State Building to almost a mile high. The compressive force of those bricks would have allowed that, the way that they were putting these things together. That's nuts. That's taller than the Burj Khalifa. Back then, they could have done that had they continued piling bricks on and stacking them up. Maybe it wasn't that they were dumb, but they decided that they didn't need God and they took it upon themselves to decide how they would spend their effort. Maybe it would have worked but God came down to remind them who was actually in control. Let's take that one step farther. If God hadn't intervened and they got their tower done, they got it completed, what would have they accomplished? Would have they actually reached God or would have they made a really, really, really tall tower? God says they can accomplish whatever they put their mind to, but he knows they can't reach him. He knows they would have had a big tower. Would have they actually been safe and happy and everything sorted out and all the problems of the world and of sin, would have that solved it? Or would have they had all of those problems and a really big tower? Maybe God not only wants to remind them who is in control, maybe he also knows that though they can build the thing they want, it won't solve the problem they build it to solve. So today, we've got even more technology. I think probably the brightest people that have ever lived are living right now. And we have more bright people because we have more people than ever. 
We can all share our ideas worldwide at the speed of light. If Justin wants somebody everywhere, if he wants the whole world to know something, he can Facebook it right now and they've got it. If you believe in some of the stuff they're already knowing because they're reading his thoughts, you know. Anyway, little conspiracy theory for Justin. It's, it's, we're living as a society today, we live in a world today where there's, we can just do whatever we want. If we, if we have a problem, we fix it. We hire people, we put the best and the brightest on it, and they get it, they get it all put together. If we have a problem, yo, we'll solve it. Check out the hook on my DJ revolves it, right? We can do whatever we want. We can fix it. And if our fixes, if our answers, if our structures that take care of all our problems aren't working, well, then it must be that we just have the wrong people in charge. Because people are capable of doing things, right? Unless God says no. So I am for science, I am for technology, but I'm for God first. This story is evidence that even if we do everything right, even if it should work, would work, God can say no. He can say, good plan, I'm not having it. I'm going to step in and, and make sure that doesn't happen. God can and will flip the script to remind us that though we were made in his image, we are not him. So my greatest frustration through this pandemic has been that no one can seem to get their act together. It seems like someone somewhere must have the thing that would fix all this. And if we could just work together, we could be done with this and everything could go back to normal. Everything could be good, right? We've got all these sides talking. This side says chloroquine. This side says quarantine and wait for a vaccine. My buddies down in Bolivia are polarized too. Last week, their Senate approved industrial bleach to drink as a cure for the coronavirus. But they've got another side too that knows that's not going to work. What you really should do is huff herbal vapors out of these like giant hookah boiler things that they've cobbled together. I can show you my Facebook videos of the guys doing that. I got buddies in Bolivia doing that right now. All around the world, turmoil and bickering, and everybody knows that if everyone would just listen to me and my way of doing this thing, this would go away and we'd be fine. We all believe that we the people could just make things right and make it go away if we just worked together and did it the right way. That may be, and I hope we do that but we can't forget who God is. More than that, if we do and succeed and knock out the coronavirus, it won't solve all our problems. We won't just be happy and everything's perfect. The same pride that told the folks in Genesis that they could reach God with a tower tells us that we can stamp out a disease if we put our minds to it. The same pride that told them they'd be safe and sound and secure if only they had this tower tells us that if we elect the right politicians and get the right Supreme Court justices in there, everything's going to be the way that it should be. But he's still God, and ultimately he'll decide if our efforts will succeed or not. And whether they do or whether they don't, that won't fix everything. We still need a savior. Our pride tells us we can build this or fix that, and maybe we can, but it also tells us if we do, then we'll be happy, then everything will be okay. And that is the lie. This isn't like rosy feel-good stuff, but it's a reminder of who we are, namely not God. It's also an explanation for why we can feel the way that we do, because God comes right out and says, we can accomplish all kinds of things. And we know that. What we forget is who has the last word. What we forget is who should be making the plans and who should be following them. What we forget is even if God allows our plans to succeed, one day we will die. And what then? What about our plans then? So, Adam, where do we go from here? I'm glad you asked. We go to Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. 
Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? And Peter answers in verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words, he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. When all the people got together to make a name for themselves, to be like God, full of pride, God thwarted their plans, as good as they were. He confused their speech so that they couldn't understand each other anymore. He knew they could build that tower, but he also knew they could never reach him. He knew the tower couldn't save them or make them happy. But then Jesus showed up. He lived his life. He died. He rose again. He told his disciples to wait and listen for him. And when they were all together, waiting and listening, not able to understand each other, all the different nations waiting, in that moment, the story that started in Genesis got its conclusion. The answer then to what do we do with Babel and what do we do with our pride is to get together not to be gods but to, and to make a name for ourselves, but to listen and learn about him. Just as God supernaturally ruined human plans by making people not get along, not be able to understand each other, he supernaturally put them all back together so that they could hear and understand one mouth, proclaiming Jesus, who was crucified, could not be held by death. He is the Lord. He's the Messiah. He died for the forgiveness of your sins. That is the answer. The only thing that saves, the only thing that will make us happy. This morning we are back in our building, and it's no ivory tower, but even if it were, let's remember to make it the Jerusalem where we come to hear, to listen, not the Babel where we pridefully try to do whatever it is that we want. The other night when I was putting Bear to bed, we read the story of the Tower of Babel out of his storybook Bible, and it inspired me to talk about it, and I liked the way that it ended, so I'm going to read you the ending of that story. After that, people scattered all over the world, which is how we ended up with so many different languages to this day. You see, God knew, however high they reached, however hard they tried, people could never get back to heaven by themselves. People didn't need a staircase, they needed a rescuer. Because the way back to heaven wasn't a staircase, it was a person. People could never reach up to heaven, so heaven would have to come down to them, and one day it would. Let's pray. Thank you.